On June 30th, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter, posted a conversation they had on her podcast about his medical situation. Since I've been updating you all on this situation as news came out, I thought I would give you a summary of where he's been and how he's doing. Also, given the nature of some of the discussion I've seen online about this, I wanted to reiterate a couple points from the first summary video I did on this. Finally, Peterson and Michaela share a lot of medication info, treatment names, just a lot of jargon really fast and don't necessarily go through what they mean, so I wanted to spend a little time going through those. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel. Let's get a disclaimer out of the way right off the bat. I am not a medical doctor, nor a clinical or counseling psychologist, or a social worker, or anybody who is training in this stuff. As such, this video is not medical advice, or psychological treatment advice, or any of that. The only advice I am qualified to give you as a cognitive psychologist is to talk to your doctor. That's it. In this video, I share some of my personal experiences and suggest that you be an advocate and active force in your treatment that you receive. As can be inferred from the pre-roll, this video is only going to partially be a direct summary or response to Michaela's podcast with Peterson. Here's what we're going to cover. First, a summary of the event timeline, as best as we can figure. This is from combining Michaela's periodic updates, plus what was said in the podcast. This will be done without comment, aside from some quick definitions or clarifications. Second, rehashing the psychopharmacology I covered in the first video I made about this, specifically about dependence and addiction. Finally, general comments of things brought up during the course of summarizing or other points in the video, as well as touching on the research for benzodiazepine use and withdrawal. And just forewarning, I'm likely to interchange benzodiazepine with benzo for short, because benzodiazepine is a mouthful. I also want to point out that another psych YouTuber, Dr. Todd Grande, has also covered Michaela's podcast. He's a counseling psychologist, as opposed to my cognitive, so his perspective is a little different. We're going to spend a bit more time going through the particulars of the timeline and psychopharmacology than Dr. Grande did, but if you have 13 minutes and would like a different perspective on this, check his video out. Alrighty, let's get started. A note about the summary. As previously described, this is the best reconstruction of events I can do based on the information from these sort of videos and social media posts. In the podcast, they went through it mostly chronologically, but when things got hairy, the linearity fell off. And I get it. The two weeks my dad spent in the ICU before he died are an absolute blur for me. It was a year after it happened, it still is 20 years after, so I understand how time kind of goes a bit wonky when you're in these sorts of situations. So I think I've got the order of events correct, but I could have put the pieces together wrong. If I did, let me know in the comments so I can fix it in the description at least. Also, I just want to make it clear at the beginning here that the point in me doing this video is not to question Peterson on his experiences. So I'm not going to question his sulfite allergy, the paradoxical reaction to benzos, akathisia, pneumonia, like I'm not questioning those things. My goal is to clean up the timeline and go into some of the things brought up in the podcast and give you a separate interpretation of what the research says, especially their claim that benzos are to be avoided. Peterson, Michaela, and her husband experienced negative symptoms after eating something that didn't agree with them. And I'm pretty sure they're referring to the somewhat infamous apple cider incident with this, and they attribute their reactions to a sulfite allergy. From Canada's food allergy website, care of Michaela's podcast description links, sulfites are a compound that can either be found naturally in some foods or as an additive, and these can be an allergen to some people. These can cause anaphylaxis in some people. The Canadian website includes anxiety and a sense of doom in the anaphylaxis symptomology here. We'll touch on this again later. Peterson describes his experience as not being able to get warm, 
fainting when he stood up, and not being able to sleep for three weeks. In the initial Rogan podcast discussion of this, he also included a sense of doom that just kept him awake at night and was just always there. And in the podcast here, he admits that it's possible he did drift off to sleep and just didn't notice or feel like he slept. His doctor prescribed him Imovane, which is a non-benzo sleep aid, which he says he hardly used because the other drug he was given, clonazepam, also known as clonopin, was effective in treating the symptoms, and that was at 0.25 milligrams twice a day. And it worked, and so he said he didn't really think much about taking it. Peterson started the year in Zurich with Michaela for an ankle surgery she went through, and then in February, Peterson and his wife Tammy traveled around Australia and New Zealand prior to the surgery she'd be having in March for cancer. In March, she had the surgery. About six weeks later, they received news from the doctor that what they had thought was a relatively treatable cancer wasn't, and gave her about a year to live. So Tammy went through another surgery to try to get rid of the cancer, last-ditch effort sort of thing, and had complications and side effects from that surgery that didn't resolve until around August. Around this time, Peterson requested that his clonazepam dose be increased because his anxiety levels were increasing, but then also said that it made his anxiety levels higher. He notes that this is an uncommon but possible reaction to benzos, and his highest dose was 4 milligrams per day. Remember that he started at half a milligram, so presumably he didn't go straight from half a milligram to four milligrams. There were probably intermediary steps along the way, but specifics are not provided. I'm also unclear when a general sense of weakness, an inability to feel joy, and a feeling of distance from those close to him started. If it happened before he started taking the benzos, after, after the dose bump, the timing of that isn't clear, although he later ascribes these things to the benzodiazepines. Peterson felt like he was getting even more anxious, so his psychiatrist recommended that he try ketamine therapy for depression and stop taking the benzos. Ketamine can be used in the treatment of depression, although it's typically done after several medication options have failed. And in digging into it a little bit, it looks like being on a benzo at the same time reduces the effectiveness of the ketamine therapy for depression. In Michaela's initial video about this, she hadn't mentioned the ketamine treatment for depression. He was off the clonazepam for a week and felt higher levels of anxiety than before, as well as the start of akathisia. Akathisia is a movement disorder where you feel like you have to keep moving, and it can be associated with severe nerve pain. It tends to be brought on by antipsychotic drugs, some selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Parkinson's disease, or even untreated schizophrenia. And given how a lot of these involve the neurotransmitter dopamine, it's thought that dopamine plays a role in some way. Treatment for akathisia can involve reducing the dose of the antipsychotic, if that was the cause, or introducing medications like benzodiazepines, anticholinergics, or serotonin antagonists, and we'll talk more about this later. Peterson admits that he should have known better than to cold turkey the benzos because of his previous research into alcoholism and the similarity between alcohol and benzos. Towards the end of September, Peterson entered treatment in New York for a rapid detox, and in Michaela's update at the time on this, she indicated that things were improving. Dad is fine. It turns out he was having a very severe allergic reaction. So that's why he had to go to the hospital and he's out now. So he's fine. He was in really bad shape and then he was having an allergic reaction to medication. So they removed the medication and the allergic reaction went away. Um, it was really bad though and now things are good. But in the podcast, they both indicate that this treatment only made things worse. They mention him coming out of the facility in New York on two medications, but don't provide specifics on what they were besides saying that they were sedative-like drugs to dampen akathisia. Peterson said they would only switch out one benzo for another, so I'm guessing this means that they switched him from clonazepam to diazepam, which is also known as Valium. And this is based on a comment later made by Michaela, where she says that they tried the Ashton Protocol. The Ashton Protocol is a gentle way to get people off of benzos. So whatever benzo they're on, you switch them to an equivalent dose of diazepam, also called Valium, and taper them down off of Valium instead of whatever they were on. 
It's added that this treatment wasn't helpful because the akathisia was caused by the benzos, and Peterson asked how long the akathisia could last and was told somewhere around two years, possibly. In November, Peterson was admitted to a Toronto hospital. Tammy was on the mend, but he wasn't. He described the hospital as worse than useless because they wanted to stabilize him, not continue to get him off the benzos. And he also says that he doesn't really have much of a memory of things after mid-December. It's unclear if Peterson was in the hospital from the time he was checked in until the time he was pulled out, or if he was in and out. From the sounds of it, it sounds like he was in there exclusively, but I'm not 100% on that. From here, he was taken to a clinic near Moscow by Michaela and her husband against the Toronto doctor's recommendations. Side note, Michaela's husband is Russian, if I'm not mistaken, so they would have had somebody who could speak the language and was familiar with local stuff. In the Russian clinic, Peterson was administered propofol and Dexter, which they said was so he could be unconscious while he was detoxed from the benzos. He was also intubated and had developed serious pneumonia in both lungs, which they said happened in Toronto. Michaela also described Peterson undergoing plasmapheresis to remove the benzos from his bloodstream. Peterson describes being catatonic and then delirious when he woke up from all of this. Michaela notes that when he woke up, he was no longer akathisic, and he agreed to that statement. He was taken to a physiotherapy rehabilitation center and was having trouble remembering how to do things like button buttons, type on keys, or even lay down in bed, and he spent two weeks there. From Russia, they went to Florida so that he could recover with family, including his parents, which means, I guess, that his parents are snowbirds. He said that his akathisia was mostly gone, but his anxiety was definitely back. And around this time, Michaela started contact with a Serbian anesthesiologist to help consult with Peterson's ongoing treatment. At some point, he started anticonvulsants for an elevated seizure risk, although I'm unclear exactly when he started these. At the time of recording their podcast, Peterson, Michaela, and probably her husband were in Serbia for Peterson to receive treatment directly from the anesthesiologist. Specifically, they say this anesthesiologist is treating the neurological damage that Peterson sustained from the benzos, but further clarification on what this damage is exactly is not provided. Peterson is thankful for his support network and the ability to go to all the places and talk to all the doctors that they did. There's a little discussion about why anybody should listen to Peterson's advice after this experience, and in the course of this discussion, he says that... A, a dependence is more ethically questionable, right? Because you think, well, everyone thinks, well, you know, what did the person, the person obviously made some errors in choice that contributed to this. And that's a reasonable objection, but. He also said that he'd always included himself in the group of people that needed to work on improving themselves. They say that the point of sharing Peterson's experience is to educate others about the dangers of benzos and that this is a worse crisis than the opioid epidemic. However, he also does concede that people respond differently to the addition or removal of different drugs. He has the perspective that the doctors weren't treating what he saw as the underlying problem, meaning the cessation of benzos, but were instead trying to treat something that didn't exist. What this non-existent condition was, I'm not clear on from the podcast dialogue. Also, there's a repeated emphasis that no psychiatrist could help him. He's still experiencing some muscle weakness and a slight tremor, they say he's still at an elevated seizure risk and is on anticonvulsants. He never wants to touch another benzo, but is starting to feel joy again. Michaela wraps things up by saying that Peterson's akathisia was caused by the benzos. She adds that most celebrity deaths are benzo-related in some way and includes a list of examples. She claims that benzos are harder to quit than other drugs and that Peterson still has neurological damage from being on the benzos, but again, no further information is provided there, and she's glad to have her dad back. As mentioned, some of this is going to be rehashing old videos of mine, so I'm going to try to make the timestamps in the description as useful as possible so you can skip those if you've seen it before. If this is the first video of mine you're seeing, hi! I've been going through the 12 rules for life from a scientifically grounded perspective, and I'm going to do the same thing here. Although, as I noted, I won't be questioning Peterson's experience of things. But I will be expanding on some things like what plasmapheresis is, or how benzos and alcohol are similar. 
For discussion and disclosure purposes, I have bipolar and generalized anxiety disorder plus some other stuff. I am on medication for these things, one of which is a benzo, so I do have direct experience with this type of medication as well as coming off of it. I also have trigeminal neuralgia, which is a nerve pain condition. It's real hoot being me sometimes. I bring that up here because I have experience with nerve pain and the struggle in getting a helpful diagnosis for that, plus the medications used to treat that. As promised, we are going to go through a little bit of psychopharmacology, which is basically drug-induced changes to your mind, which includes cognition, mood, percepts, stuff like that. So first, let's talk about tolerance. A rough definition for tolerance is that your body and brain gets used to the substance being around and adjusts accordingly. This can mean upregulation or downregulation of certain enzymes, neurotransmitters, or receptors. Depending on what substance and effect we're talking about, this can be a slow or fast process. A couple weeks to inside of a day. Second, withdrawal. So when you step down the dosage or stop taking a drug altogether, your body has to reacclimate to it not being there. Withdrawal symptoms can be thought of as your body rebounding from the effects of that drug. So for anxiety medication, which is taken for anxiety, when you step down the dose or stop taking it, the anxiety rebounds. It might even be worse than when you started the drug for a period of time. Okay, so for dependence, we can separate out dependence on the drug, medication, supplement, compound, whatever, into the physical and the psychological. First is physiological or physical dependence. This is your body becoming used to having that substance around and wanting it to continue to be around. So basically what we just talked about with tolerance and withdrawal. Your body will let you know if you're physically dependent on something. So for instance, the medication I take for my anxiety is lorazepam, also known as Ativan. I take it twice a day. If I miss a dose, several hours later, I will start to get a very specific type of headache and my anxiety will start creeping back in. It's usually when I notice like, oh, I missed a dose, whoops. Were I to push not taking a dose longer, the withdrawal symptoms would get more severe. The other major form of dependence is psychological dependence and in psychological dependence, a person will compulsively take the drug. A person who is psychologically dependent can also be physically dependent, but the behaviors that they engage in go above and beyond the normal use of the drug. At this point, the person is taking the drug to experience positive satisfaction or relief from stress or other negative emotions. The idea of a person drinking their pain away would qualify as this. To disambiguate a little, the person would be using the drug to avoid psychological withdrawal instead of physical withdrawal. So this would be more on the end of emotional or cognitive things instead of physical symptoms. The concept of addiction builds on this. In addiction, the person experiences compulsions or cravings to use the drug and continues to do so even in the face of negative consequences. There is an important distinction to keep in mind here. Physical dependence in and of itself does not make someone an addict. Cravings are a whole different beast from the normal use of the drug. So in normal use, you take it because it's part of your treatment plan, you take it however many times a day at the dosage, and you do it. In cravings, there's this intense drive and need to feel the positive effects of the drug taken. Someone who is taking their medications as prescribed probably won't face many negative life consequences for doing so. They might have to check in with their doctor periodically to make sure that the dosage is still working out for them, but that's about it. A person who is addicted may engage in risky or apparently careless behaviors to continue to use that drug. Something I want to drop in here is that depending on how you measure things, cigarettes and nicotine may be harder to quit than benzos, although arguably getting your hands on cigarettes is a whole lot easier than benzos. So from this and what was shared in the podcast, I don't think Peterson was meeting the criteria of an addict. He was physically dependent, sure, but if anything, he was acting more like an anti-addict, engaging in risky behaviors to not use a drug. Furthermore, loosely calling Peterson an addict does a couple things, none of them good. For starters, it's like trying to just dismiss him outright because of a perceived weakness or failing. Two, it's further stigmatizing a tragic and potentially life-threatening condition. The professor that I took psychopharmacology from had a pet theory, that everybody had something that they could become addicted to. Some people may go their whole lives never finding that thing, others would. And for some, 
It might just be something benign like knitting, and for others it would be something more serious like heroin. And I think part of the point of this pet theory was that we're all capable of falling down an addiction hole. Some more than others, but it's still something that could happen to anybody. One bad experience, one unlucky series of events, and potentially anybody could end up there. People who become addicted to something are still people. They may be engaging in harmful or hurtful behaviors, but they're still human beings and shouldn't be discarded. Finally, I think that Peterson's comment that everyone thinks, well, you know, what did the person, the person obviously made some errors in choice that contributed to this, is quite frankly a Petersonism. Some of us are able to have compassion and empathy for people dealing with addiction. Now we'll go through the remaining things I wanted to come back to, albeit not in the order that they were added to the list. In trying to learn more about the sulfite allergy, something I kept coming across was his emphasis on asthma or other breathing problems. Even the Michaela linked website focused on anaphylaxis. The doom and anxiety were listed under anaphylaxis. It wasn't until I got to the World Allergy Organization website that it made sense. Apparently, what happens is the sulfites are converted to sulfur dioxide and sulfurous acid in the mouth and stomach, which can then be inhaled in their gaseous form. What the fuck, bodies? Seriously? Gross. This can then irritate the airways, potentially kicking off an asthmatic or anaphylactic reaction. The World Allergy Organization lists epinephrine as the preferred treatment for anaphylaxis. And the EpiPen is this in ready-to-go form. And the Canadian website recommends carrying an EpiPen on you if you are susceptible to anaphylaxis. The part that isn't making sense for me here is the time course and what ended up being an effective treatment for Peterson. So the onset tends to be within minutes, if not an hour. Finding a tail end for how long it could last has been trickier. One paper indicates that anaphylaxis may recur up to 72 hours after the initial reaction, especially if the initial reaction wasn't sufficiently treated. And digging around, I think I found the initial guidelines that added a sense of doom and anxiety. It was included as a differential diagnosis between anaphylaxis and a panic or anxiety attack. The sense of doom and anxiety can be common to both, but anaphylaxis will also include things like hives, swelling, wheezing, and or low blood pressure. I'm also not seeing any indication for the use of benzos as a treatment of an allergic reaction. So we're going to leave this section with a shrug. An idea that was repeated in the podcast was that psychiatrists did Peterson dirty. They gave bad instructions when telling him to stop the clonazepam abruptly. They didn't want to get him off the benzos as quickly as he wanted. They couldn't help him. And I've had my share of bad experiences with psychiatrists. One in particular was all too eager to keep upping the dose of, strangely enough, clonazepam when it was losing the effectiveness in helping with my anxiety. And that eagerness was part of why I ended up firing him as my psychiatrist and led to me having to figure out my own taper schedule based on the medication I had left. I left a message with the receptionist asking not to be scheduled in future group therapy sessions and to cancel my future appointments with him and I wouldn't be seeing him as a doctor anymore. I received a call back from him not too long after that, basically threatening me. He said that if I wanted to see a psychiatrist again, I would have to go through the six month waitlist period that I'd already waited through to see him, and he was the only one who would refill my prescriptions. Not any sort of plan to help me taper off the prescriptions that he had me on. Oh no, either I continued on as a cash cow patient or he was cutting me off. So I got cut off. I worked out a taper schedule that was apparently too aggressive. So of course, my husband was out of the country for this because that's just how these things go in my life. And the first day on the reduced dose, I was very anxious. My heart was racing. I couldn't sleep. It was just, I felt wired. And so the next day, scared that I was going to have an aneurysm, I went to the urgent care clinic and a very understanding doctor helped me set up a much more kind taper schedule. There are plenty of bad psychiatrists out there, apparently, just like any profession. The one who told Peterson to cut clonazepam cold turkey after he had been on it for a couple years made a bad call. The other psychiatrist he saw, we'll get to in a bit, 
But for now, suffice it to say that not all psychiatrists are out there malpracticing left and right. I asked a medical doctor friend about the propofol-dexter combo and found out that when someone is intubated, as Peterson was, three drugs are typically present. One, a painkiller of some form, typically an opiate, which Dexter is. Two, a knockout drug, and for most normal procedures, I guess this is propofol. And three, some sort of paralyzing drug so that the person doesn't gag when the tubes put down their throat or try to rip it out. In the February update, Michaela said that he spent four weeks in the Russian ICU, and in the podcast, they say that he was intubated for nine days. So something I'm not clear on is if the intubation ventilation process was part of the rapid detox plan, or if it was a consequence of him showing up with bad pneumonia in both his lungs, both, neither, just, I don't know. As the little graphic indicates, plasmapheresis involves drawing out the blood, separating the blood cells from the plasma, then returning the blood cells with a placeholder, like saline, albumin, someone else's donated plasma, or the person's filtered plasma. It looks like it's sometimes done to get really bad things out of people, especially if it's likely to damage the liver or kidneys when it's metabolized, but typically other methods have higher efficacy. It's noted here that in the case of benzo overdose, this isn't the way to go because there is an antidote, flumazenil, and the extravascular compartment cannot be cleared effectively through the plasmapheresis. If plasmapheresis isn't all that effective at getting benzodiazepines out of the system at dangerous levels, I'm not sure how effective it would be at therapeutic levels. Nerve pain is a special form of hell. As I said, I have trigeminal neuralgia, and if you have to pick a nerve issue to get, it's not a good one to have. So I can absolutely relate to Peterson's risky drive to get rid of that pain. Given that I've been through many medications trying to figure out what the best version of working is for me, I have some experience with the types of medications that they use to treat nerve pain. And the thing that clicked for me here is Peterson mentioning that he's on an anticonvulsant or anti-epileptic drug. In my nerve pain medication adventures, many of the drugs we tried out were technically anti-epileptic drugs. Carbamazepine, gabapentin, dilantin, the list goes on. So Peterson experiencing a reduction in nerve pain coincidentally at the same time that he started an anticonvulsant drug? Maybe it's just coincidence. But going back to this muscle weakness and tremor that he says he's experiencing, hopefully he's checked that it's not a side effect of the anticonvulsants he's on because that can sometimes be a side effect of those and it can be permanent or serious. I'll try to keep this section as brief as possible and unless otherwise specified, I'm sourcing from my psychopharmacology book. So, psychoactive drugs, meaning drugs that affect the mind in some way, work by futzing with neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are how neurons talk to each other. Neurons being cells in the nervous system, especially the brain, that are used in processing and transmitting information. Neurotransmitters are used because there is a gap between talking neurons called the synapse. The neurons sending the signal will release the neurotransmitters to convey the message into the synaptic cleft the neurotransmitters diffuse across the cleft, where they can be picked up by the receiving neuron in its receptor sites. You can think of the different neurotransmitters like being keys and the receptors being locks. A given neurotransmitter is specific to certain types of receptors. Once the receiving neuron gets the message, it can either increase or decrease the likelihood of it sending its own message. Each neuron can receive input from thousands of other cells, so the relative increase-decrease message from its connections needs to be computed neurotransmitters, once bound to the receptor, don't stay that way forever. The neurotransmitter will typically fall off the receptor at some point and re-enter the gap. At that point, it may be destroyed by enzymes looking to munch that type of neurotransmitter, or it may be taken back into the message sending cell, known as reuptake, or it just might drift away. Some drugs can take the place of neurotransmitters, meaning they are functionally like a key that'll fit that lock. If they cause activity like the neurotransmitter they're replacing, they're known as agonists. If they sit in the receptor and do nothing, they are blocking the normal action of that receptor, so they're called antagonists. They could also reduce the activity of the munching enzymes in the gap, they could change how the reuptake works, they could do any number of things. Some of the neurotransmitters used in the central nervous system are Gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA for short, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. This means it makes it harder for the receiving neuron to send its message. 
Dopamine can be excitatory or inhibitory. It's important in reward-motivated behavior as well as motor control. Endorphins are complicated. They can be released by the pituitary gland in response to pain and act in both peripheral and the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, they block GABA. Blocking the inhibitory GABA increases dopamine levels, which leads to pleasurable sensations. Unsurprisingly, from what's been talked about in the podcast or the video so far, we're going to focus on alcohol, the barbiturates, or barbs for short, benzos, as well as the opioids. To start with, let's briefly talk about the clusters of drugs in a completely educational and not glorifying way at all. So there's the depressants, the stimulants, and the hallucinogens. Depressants reduce neural activity and slow bodily functions. So everything we're talking about in this video are depressants. Stimulants do the opposite of depressants. They excite neural activity and speed up bodily functions. So stimulants range from things like caffeine or nicotine all the way up to the more hardcore methamphetamine or cocaine. Finally, seated in a bean bag in the corner staring at their hands are the hallucinogens. These evoke sensory images in the absence of actual stimulus input and distort perception. Assuming you aren't buying something that's been cut by adulterants, these include things like LSD, MDMA, and Joe Rogan's favorite, DMT. So the pineal gland is a source for DMT. DMT. We know that DMT, DMT exists in the human body. So we are definitely in depressant land for this video. For each of these, we are going to talk about the medical uses, mechanism of action, acute side effects, long-term side effects of using the drug, and finally withdrawal. And something I want to point out at the outset here is that in this class of drugs, if you take too much of them, you can die. Now, it's harder to do for certain members of these categories, like Imodium AD is technically an opioid, as hard as that is to believe, and it is possible to get high off of it. It just takes enough of it that you're likely going to kill yourself doing it. So it is a risk for all of these drugs. Of the drugs we will be talking about, the one that you are probably the most familiar with, assuming you are of legal drinking age in your jurisdiction, is alcohol. So the medical uses for alcohol at this point are pretty limited. It tends to be things just like making sure an alcoholic doesn't die, assuming they don't have access to alcohol. And this is part of why liquor stores were considered essential in the current situation, because having a bunch of people trying to scrounge to make sure that they don't go into DTs is, it's a health crisis. Alcohol has its effects through a couple different mechanisms, but for comparison's sake, one that we're going to focus on is that it increases the inhibitory effects of GABA. And so that leads to the sort of chill, relaxed, sedate feeling that you get when drinking. Short-term side effects of alcohol include things like increased urination, inducing sleep, but decreasing the proportion spent in REM sleep, increasing reaction time, and general disinhibition. Long-term effects of alcohol include damage to the liver, damage to the nervous system by depleting the body's stores of vitamin B1, and heart disease. When we talk about withdrawal from alcohol, we're usually not just talking about the hangover, but we're talking about long-term chronic users, what happens when they stop. In the first stage, taking place 10-ish hours after the last drink, the person may experience agitation, tremors, sweating, and digestive upset. This tends to last about two days. The second stage occurs in people who were high users and is known as the delirium tremens or DTs. This can last just over a week and should really happen under medical supervision. There can be increased agitation, disorientation, confusion, and or hallucinations. Additionally, there's the possibility of seizures or even death. Next up are the tranquilizers, also known as anxiolytics, and sedative hypnotics. These include the barbiturates, benzodiazepines, plus things like GHB. Some medical uses of these is for helping with sleep, reducing anxiety, or preventing seizures. These have their effect by increasing the ability of GABA to work. So it would be like a separate key and lock attached to the first key and lock that makes the primary key and lock better. This is known as modulation. Increasing the effectiveness of GABA increases the inhibitory tone of the brain, which means it's more chill. It's more happy to vibe. As a consequence, you get the tranquilizing effect. At a high enough dose, the barbs can effectively replace GABA, something that the benzos can't do. And this is part of why benzos are said to be safer than the barbs. 
at high enough dose of a barb, the person can become unconscious and potentially stop breathing. That being said, the metabolism of benzos are slowed by alcohol and benzos can intensify the effects of alcohol or other depressants. This is why, should you ever find yourself with a prescription for one of these, there's a warning label not to mix with alcohol. Acute side effects range from drowsiness, impaired motor and cognitive skills, and moodiness. Tolerance to the drug may reduce the severity of at least some of these side effects. For the long-term effects, I want to point out that my guidebook doesn't have anything to say for these types of drugs. There may be strong, long-lasting cognitive deficits or emotional problems associated with use, or there might not be. Finally, withdrawal from barbs or benzos is not something to take lightly. If you are taking it at therapeutic doses, you likely don't have to worry about the super scary withdrawal symptoms. Those are similar to the chronic alcohol withdrawal, agitation, seizures if untreated, memory issues, and so forth. In the therapeutic range, there may be sleep disturbances, rebound anxiety, irregular heartbeat, a sense of unreality, muscle spasms, or other stuff like that. This could take a couple weeks to a year, but will typically come and go. It's also noted that the withdrawal may not even happen too terribly for half the people who stop, so there is a bit of variability between people in the severity and duration of their withdrawal symptoms. I'm including the opioids here because they act as an illustrative counterpoint for the other drugs that we've been talking about. The opioids include the natural opiates, opium, morphine, and codeine, as well as the semi-synthetic ones like oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, and so forth. Synthetic opioids include things like tramadol or fentanyl. The primary medical use is for pain relief. These generally work by binding to the endorphin receptor sites. Acute side effects include things like lethargy, nausea, impaired cognitive or motor function, and constipation. Like with the other drugs, tolerance may reduce the impact of some of the side effects, but not all. For example, the constipation will never go away even with prolonged use. There is a slight boost in cancer risk from prolonged opioid use, but most risk tends to happen from lifestyle-related things, which is more on the recreational end of use. While withdrawing from prolonged use of an opioid will likely not be pleasant, it's rarely fatal. It's like a combination of a bad flu plus some restlessness. Early symptoms, roughly 6 to 12 hours after the last dose, are things like restlessness, agitation, yawning, or chills. Later symptoms are when it gets ugly. The opioid slowing of the digestive tract rebounds, so you get vomiting, diarrhea, plus muscle twitches, and even more sweating. But this will typically all be over within a week. To wrap up this point, this was partially to expand on Peterson's comment that he should have known better than to cold turkey the benzos because they are similar to alcohol. It was also to give a little perspective on things that we put in our bodies. As Dr. Grande pointed out, there is risk inherent in using benzos, but there is risk inherent in using a lot of things. An example here is lithium, which is used to treat bipolar disorder, and it may have long-term consequences on cognitive ability. But as somebody who has a couple psychiatric disorders and a brain that lets me use potentially addictive drugs responsibly, I accept the risk of things that may come as a consequence of using these drugs. The quality of life improvements are worth the risks and the potential cost for me in those instances. And that's not always the case. There's been a couple drugs that I've tried for either the disorders or the nerve thing where the side effects were unacceptable and they were no longer an option or they had risks that I wasn't willing to take on. So this is a point that we'll come back to at the end. I've broken this off into its own little independent section because there's a couple more things that I want to expand on further and discuss. First, it's important to know the risks of any medication that you're being prescribed. Benzos aren't the only drugs that have an elevated suicide risk for those who take it. Other drugs include depression drugs or mood stabilizers. Benzos aren't the only drugs that have rare but potentially serious side effects. One example I lived through was with carbamazepine, also known as Tegretol, which is an anti-convulsant and nerve pain drug, and I almost had to have a blood transfusion because it depleted my platelet count for some unknown reason. Benzos aren't even the only drugs that you have to be careful what you take it with. Grapefruit juice, you know, like just the stuff you buy that's made of grapefruits, can reduce the effectiveness of cholesterol drugs, anxiety drugs, anti-rejection drugs, and blood pressure medication. I recommend getting very familiar with websites like drugs.com, not sponsored, and what levels of risk you're comfortable with. 
In the US especially, we can't necessarily rely on our doctors being able to go through the lengthy process of fully informing us of the risks and potential benefits and everything for things that they're prescribing because of the bureaucratic nightmare that is our healthcare system. They're under huge time pressures to just move through patients. If you go into a doctor's visit with a rough understanding of what you're going to be talking about and potential treatment options and which ones you're the most comfortable with, you can end up with a much more helpful and fruitful conversation than if you just went in blind. The prescribing rate of benzos may have gone up, but it hardly seems like the same situation as that in the opioid epidemic. I may be out of the loop on this, but I haven't heard anything about doctors being financially incentivized to prescribe more benzos. So far, in my experience, there hasn't been a prescribing crackdown that leads to legitimate and recreational prescription holders to consider seeking out sources elsewhere. And a complication here is that there isn't equal representation in who's getting these prescriptions. In the US, long-term benzo use is associated with one, being a woman, and two, being in the lower SES. In one of Ollie Thorne's philosophy tube videos, he brings up the concept of shit life syndrome. Basically, people who are on the receiving end of the life stick have poor health, including mental health. As such, there's an elevated rate of antidepressant prescriptions. Maybe something similar is happening in the US with anxiety meds. Peterson may have been at an elevated seizure risk as he was coming off of the benzos, but if he's been off them since February, it's probably a conservative estimate, he is well past the window of time where he would have this elevated seizure risk. At this point, it's unclear what neurological damage Peterson has experienced. And that is absolutely a very personal thing to be sharing. But an anesthesiologist can't really do much to help with neurological damage. They could help with neuropathic pain, but with neurological damage, I'm not sure what they could do. The last thing here is Michaela's point that most celebrity deaths are benzo related with examples. To be morbid, Anna Nicole Smith had four separate benzos in her system when she died, plus a couple other drugs that intensified the depressant effects. Heath Ledger had two opioids, three benzos, and an antihistamine in his system. Philip Seymour Hoffman had benzos, heroin, cocaine, and amphetamines in his. Amy Winehouse died of alcohol poisoning. She includes more, but I'll stop there. The average person who doesn't have access to a boutique doctor is unlikely to get the drug cocktails that some of these celebrities had. And besides that, I think the thing we should be emphasizing is changing the more affluent, in this case, shit life that seems to be a precipitating force in these things developing. Better mental health resources, education, support, shifting this back to the majority population, even baby steps towards fixing the income inequality situation would improve a lot of people's lives. I know I said I wouldn't question Peterson's experiences in this, but I'm going to stretch that rule a little bit to get at some subtext. So Peterson's first psychiatrist wanted to stop him on the benzos to start a ketamine treatment for depression. Then there was Peterson's comment that... You got worse and worse and worse. Well, what the psychiatrists then, there generally insisted on doing was, quote, treating the underlying problem, yeah. end quote, when the, when the underlying problem was benzodiazepine withdrawal, not some other issue. Yeah. But they didn't know what to do with benzodiazepine withdrawal, so they tried to treat something they didn't know what to do th with that didn't exist. Yeah. Or at least in all probability didn't exist. I don't think this underlying problem was ever specified. I know they mentioned the Toronto doctors wanted to stabilize him, presumably on the benzodiazepine taper and stop that until he was doing better, but beyond that, I'm drawing a blank. But from how Peterson and Michaela talk about this, it seems like there was some agreement between the different North American psychiatrists. And I know it can be an incredibly uphill battle to get doctors to actually listen to you, but if a bunch of different doctors are all saying the same thing, maybe something like, a depressive episode, that might be something to take into consideration. And it pains me, almost literally, to say this. I got lucky getting the stupid nerve thing diagnosed, and it came after years of different doctors and specialists and everybody telling me that it was probably TMJ, despite the pain 
not being quite right for TMJ, and the pain not being in the right place for TMJ, and the joint is completely fine, but, you know, it's probably TMJ. But in sitting here, spelling it all out, I guess the symptomology wasn't quite right for the diagnosis that they were trying to fit on me, and I don't know if that's necessarily true in Peterson's case. Let's wrap this up with some takeaway messages from this video. This first one is directed more at the viewers than at the podcast, but I don't think Peterson was addicted to the benzos, and throwing that term around cavalierly is harmful. It's a bit dangerous to vilify psychiatrists and encourage distrust of healthcare practitioners. Just because he had some bad experiences doesn't mean that we need to burn the whole thing to the ground, except for anesthesiologists, apparently. Likewise, the degree of scaremongering about benzos in this podcast was alarming. Yes, there are risks associated with using benzos, but there's risks associated with using a lot of things, and that's why I think it's so important that you educate yourself on what you're potentially putting into your body. I worry that demonizing another class of drugs could kick off an actual epidemic in that case. If you remove a medication that works for people, some may seek it out from illegal sources and either buy bad drugs or counterfeit drugs, or end up addicted to something worse. Why are we so determined to repeat the mistakes from the war on drugs? Related to that, do not stop any medication you're on abruptly without consulting your doctor first just because some guy on the internet had a bad experience. Now, if your doctor says to just cold turkey a benzo that you've been on for a while, like, find a new doctor, but advice still stands. And related to that, a good life lesson in general is to learn how to be your own advocate. In this context, it means understanding what you're putting into your body in prescriptions and supplements and everything. If you get the little printout thing when you get your prescription filled and some of the side effects aren't making sense, talk to the pharmacist. That's what they're there for. Learn which side effects are relatively benign, you might not need to worry about, and which ones you should really be concerned with. Learn all of this so that you understand what you're putting your body through. And yeah, I think that's where we'll leave this video. See you guys in the next one. Bye!